Well, we all know that there is no perfect balance when you are a mom or a dad and you're working, you have kids to take care of, but trying to find a balance feels, at least to me, like it is something I am always, always trying to do. And I have an expert today. I'm really excited to introduce you to Rachel Greenwald, a New York Times bestselling author. She's a matchmaker, a dating coach, also an executive fellow at Harvard Business School. And Rachel and I have been friends for a really long time. And when it comes to these issues, she is the one I like to talk to. Rachel, so good to have you on the podcast. Hi, Natalie. I'm so glad to be here. Well, I know you with three kids as well. I have three kids. You have dealt with this, but also just the, the relationship part of this and maintaining relationships. But where should we start? What do you think about this issue of balance? Do you think you really can have balance? Well, I think the phrase, um, how to balance work and life is really the root of the problem. I think if you reframe that so that there is not such a gap between your work and your life in the way you feel about living those two elements. Um, what I mean by that is that if you find quote unquote work that doesn't feel like work, I think you are starting off at a better place. And, you know, what I see out there is that people end up doing work that feels exhausting or stressful, that they don't enjoy it, um, that it zaps their energy. And so rethinking what it means to work seems like the best place to begin because then you don't have these, um, you know, night and day elements that you're battling all the time. Oh, that is such a huge issue. And you know, my story, I left 28 years of a job that I worked really hard uh, to, to get to as a morning show anchor, but it was doing exactly what you just said. It was zapping my energy. I wasn't happy. I'd come home exhausted. And then I really didn't feel like a good mom because my energy in the afternoon, when I just wanted to be with my family was gone. I felt exhausted. So it was a physical, but also a mental zap, but how can someone, so if we're, if we're digging a little bit deeper into that, how, how would you say you should go about reframing or searching for that new career? That's not possible for everyone. Okay. I actually have a really good suggestion. This is an experiment that I tried almost 20 years ago, and it came from, um, a, a, an adapted technique from dieting. So I had just had my third child and I had gained weight during the pregnancy. I was trying to diet. And I remember trying a diet where they said, get a food journal and write down everything you eat all day long in the journal so that you can really see your eating patterns. And that's going to help you lose weight. So I was doing that at the time that I was trying to figure out what I could do for work that would bring in money, but also be flexible and part-time and I could do it from home. So I got this idea to create an adrenaline journal. And in a parallel way, I would write down every single thing that I did all day long. And sometimes that would be up to a hundred different actions, everything small or big, you know, going grocery shopping or uh, singing a lullaby to the baby or uh, talking on the phone to a friend, just absolutely everything I did all day long, I'd write it down and then I would rank it on a scale of one to five stars based on how much it spiked my adrenaline. Now it wasn't about an enjoyment or an expertise to that activity. It was literally like monitoring my energy level. And so over the course of a week, I gave myself this, you know, seven day experiment. I looked back and there were, you know, a thousand or more things that I'd written down, but only two activities rated five stars that they spiked my adrenaline so much. I rated them five stars. Okay. I'm and, dying to know what those were. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> one was sort of silly, which was drinking my morning tea. I love different kinds of tea. I'm a tea aficionado. And I just looked forward to it every morning. I just was so into it. 
And I thought about what could I do with tea? I didn't want to open a tea shop or whatever. So I just kind of got rid of that one. The other one really turned into my career and my passion. And that was a phone call I had with a single friend of mine who was about uh, late thirties, early forties. And she called me out of the blue just to complain about her dating life. And I have no idea where that adrenaline came from, but it spiked inside my body like lightning struck. And all of a sudden I was, yeah, I can picture myself. I was um, standing up in my kitchen, pacing, giving her advice. I had the phone glued to my ear, everything around me, including the baby crying, like mm -hmm. fell away. And I was in the zone. And what was so interesting is that it, it was so unexpected, you know, before this experiment with the adrenaline journal, if you had asked me what kind of work I should do, I would have asked questions like, well, what kind of experience do I have? And what do I think could make a lot of money? And, you know, things like that. And that's not where I discovered what really energized me. It was through this activity. And I went back and unpacked that through friends and family over the next days when I discovered this, you know, five-star rating about something like dating as a married woman with three kids, like how unexpected. And people in my life reflected back to me that I had been obsessed with dating my whole life and no one had even told me that, you know, I had a high school friend who said, you know, the reason I got a C in English was because you kept passing me notes in class about who was dating who <laughs> I'm like, really? I love that. And then I had a Another friend who said, you know, every time I go to a dinner party with you, the first thing you do is turn to the person next to you and say, how did you meet your wife or your husband? You're obsessed with how people meet. I, I am. I had no idea. Anyway, this is how I discovered the topic. And then, you know, I think that's half the battle because your original question was, how do you balance work and life? That it really requires saying, how do you make your work more like your life and something that you feel passionate about so that it's not so much of an effort? Wow. I, what a great story and what a great exercise for all of us. I, you know, in making this change in my life in the last year, I, I had to do a similar type of exercise. I didn't write it down like that, but it was, what could I talk about all day long and still feel energized by it? What could I just yes. like dive into and feel energized every time I sit down at my desk, I'm excited about it. And for me, it's, it's learning. It's talking to people like you, it's spreading that information. It's getting that information to people. So I love that exercise. And I'll, I'm going to add this because I know you in your world will appreciate it. I gave myself three things at any job um, through my um, 28 years on television and then moving to a different television station and different things, three things that I needed to stay at a job. And I heard this somewhere in college. I don't even know where, but I've, I've carried it with me and it is, I want to be happy. I just want to feel happy that feeling that you have that I wake up happy to go to work. I want to be challenged by what I'm doing. And I want to feel proud of what I'm doing. And I can hear that in everything that you've just said about what you do. You just love doing it. You're challenged still by it. And you're proud of the product that you have and the books that you have and the people that you help. Um, I'm, you I'm know, I love your... that because what you've just described is so applicable to the dating world as well. You know, so when I've been <laughs> used dating and created this career as a matchmaker. One of the things that I always talk to people about are their must haves and deal breakers. So yeah. what you just described with feeling happy and challenged and proud, there's such a parallel uh, list in the dating world. So yeah. I love that you boiled it down to the three most important things. That's a great, they have served start. me well, they have served me well over those, over the many years of making job changes. Um, okay. So back to this balance, if you're happy and proud and you you're energized by your job, then you're, you're saying that you will have more balance, but let's turn it to the family side. Like I always think of the pendulum 
and it's going to swing one way really heavy one day. And then I'm going to swing all the way the other way with the kids. They're going to have needs and I'm going to have to step away a little bit from the job, but let's go to the family side of it and, and finding that kind of happiness in those relationships. I know that's your specialty with your family, with your spouse, with your friends. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, such a good question. Well, I think the first thing is to understand whether you're a good multitasker or not. Some people are really good at that. Others aren't. I am someone who really likes to focus on one thing. So I don't find that I can be present and effective in the home with my husband, with my kids, if I am distracted by a lot of, um, you know, work items. So I have tried to find more balance by doing project work where I can say, okay, I'm going to take a project. It's going to last three months. And at the end of that, I am not going to take another project for X number of weeks or months so that I can focus entirely on the family. And those cycles change every year and depending how old your kids are and depending where you are in your life. Um, so for example, um, our family took a one-year sabbatical and lived in Barcelona. So we took all three kids out of school when they were in middle school and we moved to Barcelona. So that was a year where I took on no projects. I was a hundred percent focused on um, being present in our new environment in Spain and helping the kids get adjusted and enabled in order to afford that I had taken on, you know, triple the number of clients and projects the year prior, because I knew we were going to be doing that. So I think for me, it's more about toggling back and forth between focusing on one and focusing on the other. And in order to do that, I've tried to find work that is more project-based rather than to um, take on big jobs that are more steady and ongoing. And there are trade-offs to both. You know, obviously the project work can be more risky and more unpredictable, but I think um, for me, that's how I've tried to balance, quote unquote, balance. I love that you do that. And it's, it's kind of the new work that I have now in these projects uh, versus a daily job, which not, it can't be for everyone. And some people have to have that regular salary, but I want, I want to talk about the world we live in of technology now, because when you said um, you don't enjoy multitasking, I've always prided myself in being a good multitasker. And I think moms have to be in, in many ways, we just are multitaskers. We have to deal with a child and the phone and other stresses in life all at once. It's really hard to focus on one thing. So we learn, it's almost a, I like to say it's a learned habit of multitasking. And I have tried to retrain myself to not multitask as much, but it's hard with technology today. Our phones are dinging and the kids are on the other side of the room and the computer's in front of me. And, and at one time when I was doing the morning news, I, I would have six, seven devices in front of me while I was live on television and someone's talking in my ear. So I had this trained habit almost of, I needed that. I needed that to feel successful. How would you suggest we untrain ourselves from multitasking? Well, it is really hard. I mean, I think what you're making the distinction between is digital distractions versus being present with somebody who is in your physical space, um, or at least that part of it. Um, and of course, even within a category like family, um, focus on family still requires subcategories of multitasking with multiple kids and multiple um, <clears throat> tasks and uh, things around the home. So I think one of the, um, the hidden gems of being able to focus and be present is verbalizing what's going on. And by that, I mean, if you 
get an email or a text when someone is talking to you and there's a ding sound on your phone, I think you have to verbalize to someone, um, you know, if you're talking to your child, you say, um, I heard the ding on my phone, but you've got my full attention. I'm not going to look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of just letting them see your eyes dart to the phone, they sense even on a subliminal level, even if you don't go look at that text, they sense that you've been distracted Mm -hmm. and you've lost their belief that you're focused on them. So I think just learning to say out loud, um, either you have my full attention, don't worry, I'm not going to look at that or the opposite. Like I really care what we're talking about. Um, can we push the pause button for 30 seconds while I turn the stove off because the water's boiling or whatever it is. So not, um, pretending that distractions aren't happening, but rather calling them out so that somebody knows without a doubt what you're focused on right now. And if it's a short break that you need, or you're not going to take a break, but you've acknowledged that something happened, I think that goes a really long way to preserving the connection that you have with the person you're talking to. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I love that advice from your children to your spouse, to your friends. I mean, how many times have we been at dinner and someone is checking on their phone? You don't really know if they're fully involved in the conversation. And that's so frustrating. So verbalizing that um, at every step. So, yeah, and, you know, I really like you, that. this is so important. I think people are delusional that they think someone else doesn't notice when your attention has strayed. They think they're clever. You know, you're on a zoom call and you've got your phone underneath the desk and your eyes look down for a second and you think, oh, no one notices. Everyone notices. So you have to believe that everyone notices when you are distracted and now how are you going to handle it? Not how can I get better at disguising it? That's so funny. I noticed that even with um, an Apple watch, people who are always, are you checking the time? Did you get a message? Are you, you know, there are so many distractions. My husband likes to say that he, and he definitely is good at this and I'm not, he puts things into categories and he can compartmentalize and say, I am in the work box right now. And now I'm in my family. And and I think of that, like visually, I think of, okay, I'm in that box and I'm not going to worry about those other things, but I still struggle with I'm working, but I, what are the kids doing? If they know I'm working and the opposite, I'm sitting here doing homework with my 11 year old, but I have a feeling that email just came in. And again, I'm trying to untrain these bad habits. You know, I think there's an underutilized resource here, which is asking your kids and your spouse for feedback on how you can get better at handling all the demands in your life. You know, instead of looking at the problem as something you need to get better at on your own, I think it's always important to get advice from the people it's impacting. And I wonder what your kids and your husband would tell you if you said to them, you know, you've seen me try to cope with all the things that are going on. And, you know, I'm wondering if I have some blind spots, like what can I do to get better at you know, whatever your goal is focusing on the family and not getting distracted by digital tools or, you know, whatever the question is, but it's the people in your home that are going to give you the best feedback. Um, you know, I don't know what they would say because everybody has their own style and their own challenges. And so it's not a one size fits all kind of advice. You have to go to the source of the people who watch you going through it and know you the best. That is great advice. And I think when you, when you just said that asking for their feedback, you're not only getting their really important feedback from the people you love the most in your own household, but you're modeling to them that asking for feedback from those around you is not a weakness. It's really important so for them yes. to hear that and do the same. Oh my gosh. I love that. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. That is crucial. Yeah. I, thank you for the advice. I love it. 
Okay. So anything else here on this work life balance? I, I, I don't like using that term because I don't ever think it's perfect, but anything else, other strategies or suggestions that you have? Well, I believe in the do not disturb sign. So, um, I, you know, have a old, uh, do not disturb sign from a hotel once. I don't even know where I got it from. I probably swiped it from someplace 20 years ago and I put it on the door to my office, my home office. And it just really helps, um, signal that I'm focused on something and, it's um, easier for me to be really productive if people aren't constantly interrupting me. So I let the family know, and because I work from a home office, that when the do not disturb sign is on the door, don't come in unless there's an emergency. And I don't know, that just is this small little visual symbol that really has allowed me to um, be more efficient. Um, because if I can get work done in a concentrated amount of time, I can be more present in the rest of the house with the family. And I don't have to feel guilty about saying, oh, wait, sorry, can, can you come back later? You know, if they knock on the door or, you know, oh, let me just finish this one thing and then I'll get to your question. You know, that really has an emotional toll. I feel like on the kids where they feel like they're not as important as what I'm doing, but when they see that do not disturb sign, it's not personal. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. And then you are focused and you know, I've got this hour, this two hours, whatever it is, I need to get it all done so that I can go and be very present on the family side as well. Um, exactly. I, I have an, another guest who said she puts a, a towel at the bottom of the door and the kids know towels up means I can't go in. I put a sticky note on the door and it just says mom's working and they know when the sticky notes there, they don't come in. So <laughs> there are lots of ways you can do that. Perfect. <laughs> well, I, I really have loved this conversation. Such great advice. I appreciate it so much. I'm going to put a lot of these things that you just mentioned uh, in the show notes. Um, I have a couple of questions I like to ask of every guest. So um, bear with me here. The first one is you are such an organized person. Your books are so successful. You, you have, your kids are amazing. I like to learn from others. And the first question is what productivity tool, and it doesn't have to be a digital tool. It can be anything do you like that helps you the most in life? Okay. Well, I'm going to say something that I don't know if it's considered a tool, but I consider it a tool. Um, it's a two letter tool and the letters are N O saying no is the best productivity tool that has served me. Well, I think that we are so inclined, especially as women to say yes to things and then, you know, end up regretting it and your productivity goes down because you're simply overcommitted. So, you know, let's start with the most basic and simple thing you can do. It's free and it is so liberating to say no to the things that you don't love. Um, and that, even if you think that you might love something, but you're overscheduled saying no and letting go to something, um, gives you back your sanity. So that's what I would say. Best advice. I love that so much. I can't tell you I'm guilty of that feeling like I need to say yes, but learning to say no. Okay. Second question. And I know this is a deep one uh, for the end of the podcast, but what what do you consider your passion to be? When did you discover that? I, you told the story a little bit earlier of, of your adrenaline um, journal. And uh, it sounds as if that's when you found what you love to do. Is, would that be the answer to what your passion in life is and when you found it? Yeah, I think it's related to that um, very much. Um, I guess I would say that what I feel like my purpose is, is to shine a light on a blind spot that I think most people have. And this is true in love and in life and in work in any context. I feel like most people make thinking decisions instead of feeling decisions. And it's my belief that decisions made through feelings 
are, even if they're illogical, sometimes that those are the ones that lead to happiness. So, you know, whether it's in the dating world that people focus on what they want on a checklist, that those are thinking decisions, you know, I, you know, with my brain, I, I have decided that I want someone of my same religion, or I want someone, you know, with a certain profession or education background, whatever it is, um, versus thinking about how someone makes you feel and thinking, um, sort of thinking with your gut and your adrenaline and your energy instead of with your brain. Um, it's just sort of life advice that I think most people overlook. They overlook it at work as well, where, you know, I shared this adrenaline journal. I never would have found what I love to do at work if I had thought my way into a decision by saying what makes money or what experience do I have or what jobs are available, that would have been my brain making the decision. And it's only through monitoring my adrenaline levels and how things made me feel, how they made me feel energized and excited. Did I come to this um, solution of working in the dating and relationship space? So, you know, shining a light on that blind spot that people have, I think is what I was meant to do. And I probably discovered it about 20 years ago, like I said, after my third child was born. So I was, you know, in my uh, late thirties, early forties at the time. That is important. I think to point out to people that sometimes it comes in our twenties. Sometimes people know as they're teenagers, what they want the rest of their life, but learning to tune in um, to that energy or that, that gut feeling versus your brain. I mean, you want it, you have to use both, but really, I love that advice. So, so good. So I know some of what you've told us today, you also um, work with people at a retreat and I'm going to come Rachel, I, I'm excited to come to one of your retreats, but will you tell me more about them? They're in Tucson, right? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you're going to come. We are going to have so much fun. Um, I've been doing uh, two different retreats at Canyon Ranch Spa in Tucson, Arizona, um, and they are uh, very different. One is a post-divorce boot camp, and it's a three-day retreat where singles come to basically be guests at Canyon Ranch. And uh, every day there are several different optional sessions that you can come and um, participate with other people who are post-divorce. Um, and in fact, you don't even have to be post-divorce. You can be single at any for any reason. Um, you could be widowed, you could be never married, whatever, but it's essentially how to rejuvenate your love life. And it's kind of a whole person approach looking at your energy levels, your health, your nutrition, and then very importantly, the tactics to succeed in today's modern dating world so that you can really be more efficient in meeting the love of your life. Um, and then the second retreat I do is uh, an executive retreat. It's a six day retreat at the life enhancement center at Canyon ranch in Tucson again. And that one is called relationships that work. And it's focused on examining your relationship with about 12 different entities in your life. So your relationship with yourself, your relationship with exercise, your relationship with nutrition, and then I teach four sessions during that retreat myself, and I teach uh, your relationship with work, your relationship with love, your relationship even through a Zoom window. So it's more of a, a well-rounded approach for um, executives, whether you're single or married, it doesn't have anything to do with dating. And uh, they're really powerful retreats. They're really life-changing. I love that being able to focus as we talked about today and finding balance when you can get away and really focus and learn and help yourself. We're just going to grow so much. Rachel, I can't thank you enough. It's so good to connect with you. And I, I just appreciate you, your knowledge and your advice so much. Oh, thank you for having me. It was really great to reconnect with you. Thanks, Natalie. Talk to you again soon. All right. That was so good. And we were, we were 
25 minutes, maybe a little bit over, but that's okay. Okay. Well, yeah. Feel free to edit. To go long. I mean, feel free to edit right. anything. I don't think too. we need yeah. to. Good. All right. So that is going to upload here. Okay. So with the second topic, um, let's see. I'm trying to think of how. Um, what kind of tips do you, do you kind of want to, do you want me to prompt you on with this? I thought our conversation was good. I just like to have an idea of how to move along so I can keep it moving. Yeah. Do you mean, um, like for this topic of reconnecting, like what yeah. areas? Um, yeah, I think, uh, focusing on maybe, uh, this, hesitancy that people have to socialize again, that they've created new habits and they um, have retreated. Is that a good thing? Or, you know, should we force ourselves to get back on the horse and socialize? And how can we make socializing more enjoyable? Um, and especially uh what, what really creates, um, fulfilling interactions between people? Does it have to be in person? Can it be virtual? Hmm. Um, you know, those kind of things. I don't know I if like that's that. cool. yeah. Okay. I think that's good because you know, the, what I worry about why I like this topic is people who, and I have friends and I have family who have just, they have just stayed inside and our mental health, like we don't want to get too deep here into mental health, but I think the mental health part of this in staying connected with people, increasing um, interaction, how do you do that in a fulfilling way if you aren't going back out into society? So maybe we can talk about both. If you're out and about how to reconnect, and if you've decided, I really just need to stay home, there are going to be some of those people, how to make sure those relationships are still fulfilling. Does that sound good? Yeah. And, and also like, are there any, yeah, those are all perfect. And then I would add, um, are there any tactics to make conversations on zoom more fulfilling and less oh. fatiguing? Okay. Let's do that. Okay. I mean, a lot of meetings and I know some of the boards I'm on and stuff, they're just switching to virtual people just like it, you know, but yeah, not connecting with people the same way. Great. Okay. I'm going to use kind of the same introduction. Um, I'll just do a little bit of a hello, and then I'll introduce you the same way with the same, um, the same things I did before. And we'll just okay. Decide. Yeah. And I've got new uh, productivity tools and purpose to talk about. <laughs> okay. Oh, those were perfect, by the way. Oh, good. Passion instead of purpose. I didn't mean to say that. But... <laughs> Okay, oh no, yeah, no, no, no. But loved those. Okay. However, however you want to phrase them, and um, I'll give you two new ones. Okay, perfect. Okay. Oh wait, 